John chapter number 1. How many of you grew up in a church and you remember singing the doxology before every service? Anybody go to a church like that? Yeah, we did too. I remember as a little boy. I, did, I couldn't understand that. Got tired of singing it. And then I finally figured out what it meant as I grew older. Man, it's very, very meaningful and very powerful. John chapter number 1. We're going to be looking this morning, tonight, and of course uh, next Sunday morning. We're going to be looking at uh, the birth, the death, or the life, the death, and uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to look at his life, and I have entitled the message very simply this morning, Jesus came. And then tonight we're going to be looking at his death, and I have titled the message very simply, Jesus died. And then you guessed it, next Sunday morning, very simply, we're going to look at Jesus rose again. Amen? Amen? Jesus rose again. If you read the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, you come away with the correct conclusion that man has been separated from God because of man's sin. Now, man did not become separated from God because of anything God did. You see, God does not have to be reconciled to man. It is man that must be reconciled to God because it was our sin that separated us from Him in the first place. Well, while deeply wanting to reconnect with God, man has become his own worst enemy. The pull from the flesh and the things of this world is so great that we are incapable of overcoming by ourselves. You know, it's pride that keeps us from surrendering to the rule of someone else. Sinful desires keep us at odds with the Creator or with the God who created us and loves us. Stubbornness keeps us or causes us not to listen to God's voice which can bring help and hope and life and light if we would just listen to His voice and obey His voice. God speaks, but that's the history of mankind. That is the Old Testament in a nutshell. God spoke, but as the Old Testament comes to a conclusion with the last verse and the last period in the book of Malachi, so concludes the voice of God to His children for 400 years. Not a word from God for 400 years. The heavens were silent to the people of God for hundreds of years. In Genesis chapter 6, God's crowning creation, which you and I know is mankind, in Genesis 6, God's crowning creation had so broken the heart of God that God voiced His lament and said that He even regretted the day that He had even created mankind. I thought about that and maybe, just maybe, God shut His mouth to His children for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew because once again He had become so disheartened with His creation. You read from Genesis to Malachi and you read about sin, you read about rebellion, you read about pride and immorality and violence and fraud and lying and stealing and cheating. How sad. But all of this truth illustrates what we all know and what we'll read in just a moment. It illustrates the truth that this world truly does walk in darkness. This world, I told Stacy just this last week, I have come to the place in my life where I dread to even turn the TV on to any news channel. I've come to the place where I dread to, to get on the internet and see what's going on in the news, the local news, just our local news. It is enough to make a dead man discouraged. Amen? I, I, I dread watching our state news, or reading our state news, our, our national news, or even uh, worldwide wide news. It's depressing. Is there any good news out there, or is it all wicked? Abortion and murder and rape and domestic violence, bombings, wars, 
drugs. The world walks in darkness. We can't even argue that. But that's precisely why Jesus came into this world. He came to bring light and life to the darkness. Jesus came to offer hope and help to a people, you and me, offer help and hope to a people who are estranged from God. You know, John chapter 1 basically tells the same story as does Genesis 1. God created all there is. And without God, nothing was made that was made, John says. Uh, he created us. He loves us. He wants to have an ongoing relationship to us. We are the crown of His creation. Listen, He blew into us His breath, which gave us His Spirit, which instilled in us life and will and emotion. It instilled within us a uh, decision-making process. Yet God's creation chose to sin. And in that decision, the darkness that existed in Genesis chapter 1 fell upon us once again. And so God put His plan in motion to restore our relationship to Him. And He wants this for all of His crowning creation. His plan, very simply, was to send His only Son Jesus into this world to make a way for us to live and to get out of this world one day and to live with Him for all of eternity. And so in that context, the magnitude of John's words in chapter 1 are realized. I want you to stand as we honor the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. And I want to be in reading in verse number 6. I'll finish reading in verse 14, but in our message today, we'll probably look down through verse 18. Verse 6, Jesus came. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John himself now is talking about John the Baptist in verse 6. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Now listen, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now listen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus came right there. Now listen to what John said. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now like this, full of grace and truth. Father, we love You. God, I pray that as we walk through these verses this morning, I pray if there is anyone here today that has not received You and believed on Your name, God, I pray that they would come today in simple childlike faith and receive you as Lord and Savior of their life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. These verses should arrest the attention of everyone who reads them. Knowing that as God's crowning creation we walk in darkness. Knowing that we have lost our way in this life and knowing that without some change in our life, we will die and go to hell. And the Bible teaches that hell is a place where the worm does not die and that the fire for all of eternity is not quenched. To think that God would do what He has done in Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, it should overwhelm us with amazement. It should overwhelm us with gratitude. It should drive us to our knees in repentance. Drive us to our knees in faith in Him. Crying out for forgiveness. Crying out for salvation. And then thanking Him for bringing light and bringing life into our lives. Amen? Amen. There are three things that I think about that come to my mind when I contemplate that Jesus came. 
And I want you to put that in the context of your individual life. You could, you could write this on, on your paper as I did in my notes. Jesus came, and in parentheses I put, for me. Jesus came for me. Now I want you to notice what we just read in verses 10 and 11. The Bible says in verse 10, He was in the world and the world was made by Him. He was in the world. That's speaking of Jesus. Jesus came. He was in the world. That sounds good. Uh, the Bible says in verse 11, He came to His own. That sounds even better. Hey, that truth ought to encourage you this morning that Jesus came to you and Jesus came to me. The song says, When I could not come to where Jesus was, He came to me. That is the story right there of Christianity. Christianity is not man reaching up to God. Christianity is God reaching down to man by the cross through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice those last few words in verse number 11. Even in verse number 10. Notice the last few words in verse number 10. The Bible says, In the world knew Him not. In verse 11, the Bible says, His own received Him not. So we're thinking first of all about the sorrow of Jesus. I, I, I see as I think about this, I think about the sorrow of Jesus that we find in verses 10 and 11. Why do I say sorrow? Well, it's very simply stated right there in verses uh, 10 and 11. First of all, it's sorrowful because Jesus was rejected by His own creation. He was rejected by His own creation. Notice what John records here. Uh, John records that they did not know Him in verse number 10. They didn't have knowledge. They did not believe in Him. Now listen, do you know what breaks the heart of our Lord? I told the early service, and it's hard to do this, but you know what I'm saying when I say this. Try to put your... your uh, uh, self in the position of God the Creator. God making His crowning creation which was mankind. You uh, just put yourself in that position. You have a child. You love that child. You do your be very best to give that child everything that he or she needs. And do you know what you get in return? That child that you carried, ladies, for nine months. That child that you nursed, the one you opened your heart to, dads, turns and walks away from you. Every action, every decision is contrary to the way you thought you had raised them. The way you thought you have taught them. And because they believe and act and live so differently than the way in which you would approve of, they just simply break contact with you. And as a result, it breaks your heart. That child that you love, that child that you procreated with your wife or with your husband one day, after they leave your loving care, they just turn and walk away from you. Now if you can get that divine picture, then you get it. Our Lord created us. You know what we did as mankind? We walked away. Now I'm speaking... Uh, to some here today who are living where I'm preaching. God created you. God gave you life. He died for you. Yet you still reject Him today. You're lost in your sin. And most people, most people uh, are satisfied in our world today. They're satisfied in their sin. And so God sent you here today so that you would hear how much God loves you and how much He wants a love relationship with you. Listen to me. God doesn't hate you. I told you that uh, a few weeks ago. God does not want to judge you. God wants to save you and bring you into His family this this morning. Jesus was rejected by His own creation, but I notice the second thing that is very sorrowful to me in these verses. He was rejected by His own chosen children. He was rejected by His own chosen children. The Bible says in verse 11, He came unto His own and His own received Him not. Understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth as a Jew. 
Jesus did not come to this earth as an American white man. He did not come to this earth as an African American or Chinese or Je Jesus Christ came to this earth as a Jew. He came to his own people. He came as a Jew to the Jews and he came for the Jews. In Genesis chapter number 11, God proclaimed that the Jews were his chosen children. Matter of fact, he told Abraham, the, the father of the Jewish race, he said, get up and go to a land that I will show you. And all throughout the Old Testament scripture, God dealt with the Jewish nation like they were his own children. Because they were. They were his chosen children. And so the Jewish nation was not ignorant like those in verse 10 were simply ignorant. They did not know. No, the Jewish nation, God's chosen children, they weren't ignorant. They were obstinate. They just rejected Him. They didn't want Him. They could not fathom. They could not comprehend in their mind. They did not want to believe that their Messiah, their King, their ruler who would deliver them from Roman oppression one day, they could not believe that He could come from such humble beginnings as a man from Nazareth. Matter of fact, it was Nathaniel who said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And so His own people rejected Him. The sorrow of Jesus coming, living, dying, resurrecting and ascending is that even today people still rejecting. People will come to this service and sit in this worship center. They'll go to Sunday school class and hear a great Bible lesson. They will be a part of a small group, men's group, women's group, youth group, student group, uh, children's group, many other groups. They will come and hear the gospel of Jesus clearly proclaimed only to offer a half-hearted attempt at following Jesus. The longer I'm in this, the longer I'm ministering and the longer I'm studying Scripture, I'm coming more and more convinced, fully convinced, that Jesus, when He calls, He demands all or nothing. I'm actually of the persuasion that that is why creation rejects it. That is why His children reject Him. It's because He demands all or nothing. He, he, it's no, uh, uh, hot or cold. It's not hot or cold. It's nothing in between, my friend. He wants hot. He would rather you be cold. But lukewarmness makes Him sick. So it's all hot. Or it's nothing. Those of you that have never been saved, you're in here today Many of you choose to reject Him because you know you will have to give up your life in order to honor Him. Many people like their sin too much. So much so that they're willing to die and go to hell in order just to hang on to their sin in this life. Those that are saved. Maybe you're here and you are one of His children, but you're half-hearted in your commitment. Because there is a desire in your heart, there's a desire in your life to go to heaven when you die, but you still want to live the way you want to live while you're here on this earth. I mean, Sundays are for Jesus, but don't infringe on my life too much. Just enough of Jesus for me to say at your funeral that you were saved. Had three funerals in the last seven days, eight days, and I'm glad I could stand in those memorial services and claim because of these folks' own testimony. I could claim that they were saved and I knew them, but their life backed it up. Hey, amen? It's one thing for me to say it, but it's another thing for me to see it. And I'm glad I could see it in their lives. They backed up what they professed. But listen to me. Some folk, folks want just enough of Jesus so that I'll be able to stand up at their funeral and say, hey, this person was saved, but then, but then the family makes me go out and lie about their commitment to Jesus so as not to offend any family members or friends by telling the truth about how all you really had was Sunday salvation. Possibly in this room, some have attempted a half-hearted approach to following Jesus. The real sorrow in our lives 
is that with Jesus, it's all or nothing. He demands my life, my soul, my all. So I see the sorrow of Jesus in these verses, but I also see Jesus came. I see His supremacy. The supremacy of Jesus in verses 14 through 16. When I'm talking about the supremacy of Jesus, we could, we could really interchange with that word sovereignty. Sovereignty. That word sovereignty means in all His brilliance in the context of these verses in 14 and 16. Uh, the dictionary defines sovereignty as the quality or state of being sovereign. It adds to it the exercise of or right to exercise size supreme power, dominion, sway, supremacy, and independence. And so basically, supremacy or sovereignty is the absolute right of God to do all things according to His own good pleasure. Now notice verse 14. John says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now go down to verse 16. I love this verse. And of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For that is the picture of the supremacy and sovereignty of God. In verse 14, we beheld His glory. In verse 16, we were heaped, we received grace upon grace. So the supremacy or sovereignty of Christ, first of all, was revealed in His glory. John said we beheld His glory. Glory in relation to John now, Christ's glory was not a mystery. John wrote this gospel somewhere near the end of the first century, somewhere around 80 to 85 AD. John had followed Jesus in the early part of the century, and John was a part of a special group. John got to see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. John got to see Jesus who interacted with over 500 people in 40 days after His resurrection. John was one of the ones who were present as he, at His ascension when Jesus went back to heaven. So John had beheld the glory of Christ. Think with me about that glory that John beheld. He saw the brilliant glory of God Almighty on the inside of Jesus manifest itself on the outside of Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the supremacy and glory of Christ as Christ conquered death and walked this earth as a risen Christ for approximately 40 days after His crucifixion and resurrection. John saw the sovereignty of Christ as He defied the laws of gravity there at the Mount of Olives and He ascended back to glory to sit down at the right hand of authority with His Father. John witnessed the glory of Jesus. After witnessing Jesus in all of His glory, John knew who and what Jesus was. John was not surprised at the healings, the feedings, the uh, demons that were cast out. He was not surprised uh, uh, to see him raise people from the dead. And, and finally, when it dawned, all these things dawned on him, he was not surprised to find his grave empty three days after the crucifixion. Can't you hear John running after all these After it finally dawned on him and some of those dumb disciples, listen, can't you hear John running toward that tomb that day shouting the whole way, man, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. The glory which John had seen is likely why just a few years later he was inspired to write that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have felt, we proclaim to you. His supremacy was seen in His glory, but it was proven by His grace. Verse 16 and 17, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given, verse 17, by Moses, but grace and truth came by 
Jesus Christ. Well, we love to talk about grace. Especially when we're on the receiving end of it. Amen. I want to remind you this morning, mercy is, is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We don't deserve. I really like to receive grace. I've asked you for grace many times in the last 20 years. I've received grace from many of you. I, re I need to receive grace many times from my wife. I, I need her to extend grace to me, but I'm telling you, the greatest need for grace in my life is the grace of Almighty God. And that's the greatest need of grace. Uh, the greatest uh, need that you have in your life is the grace of Almighty God. Verse 16 speaks of us receiving grace for grace or grace upon grace. Now how does that happen? It happens from the fullness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it in verse 14. Underline it. says that Jesus was full of both grace, or verse 16, both grace and truth. That word full means complete or replete or full to the top. I've told you this before, but Jesus or God always acts in superlatives. He does not just give us grace. He gives us grace for grace. He gives us grace upon grace. He gives us beyond what we think, what we ask, what we know, what to ask for or even need. The concept of grace begins and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was full of grace. He was full of truth. Verse 17 tells us that Moses gave the world the law, but Jesus gave the world grace and truth. Grace is an interesting word. In the original language, it is the word charis. C-H-A-R-I-S. It means that which affords joy. Delight. Sweetness. Loving kindness. And my favorite, favor. Favor. Uh, most of us think that a favor is something someone does for you, like, like run an er errand. Or perform a service. They do a favor for you. They do a good deed for you. And you would be exactly right. But listen to me. Don't discount the favor of God. I'm telling you, God ran a divine soul-saving errand for you. He ran to the cross. He performed a divine service. He paid our sin debt. He did a good deed. He made a way for me to know Him. So when you gain the favor of God, He shows you preference. He shows you esteem and kindness. We need to speak more today about the favor of God. I need His favor. I want His favor. It's good to have His favor. One preacher said, grace and truth make a good casserole. <laughs> that leads me to my last point. There's salvation in Jesus. That's the third truth I see in these verses. I see salvation in Jesus. Now I want you to look back with I want you to look back at verses 10 and 11 and verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 constitute the difference for all of mankind. But these verses have to be appropriated in your life for them to make all the difference. The people of verses 12 and 13 are set apart from the people in verses 10 and 11. In verses 10 and 11... The Bible says He came into the world, but the world knew Him not. Verse 11 says He came into His own, but His own received Him not. Verses 12 and 13 says... That those that would believe on Him, receive Him, and believe on His name, what? He gave them the power to become the sons of God. The children of God. And so, verses 10 and 11 reflect an eternal tragedy. Rejection. They reject the life given. But as many as received Him, as many means all. It's all inclusive language. The as many as are all in this verse means you. Listen to me. Everybody look at me. Jesus came to this world for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus was buried for you. Jesus was resurrected for you. Jesus ascended for you. He wants you to be in a family relationship with Him. Have a changed life on this earth. An abundant life on this earth. And He wants you to spend all of eternity with Him. 
how? He answers it right here in verse 12. First of all, you receive Jesus. As many as received Him. That means more than an acknowledgement. To receive means that you allow Him into your life and like you would allow a friend to come into your home. Last night our doorbell rang about 8 o'clock. You know what we did? We looked. And we said, come in. Because we knew who it was. We invited them to stay and to fellowship with us. You receive them because you know them. You want to experience life with them. You want to enjoy their company. Such is the case with Jesus. He rings the doorbell of your heart. He knocks on the door. And He waits for your response. What are we to do? We, we want to be saved. We want that salvation. We must receive Him. Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. And as he preached that great Pentecostal sermon, listen, you know what happened? The people were convicted of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to the heart, the Bible says. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do? You must receive. Listen this morning, you're in here, you want salvation today, you must receive Jesus. But there's a second thing, you must believe on Jesus. Look at verse 13, you believe on His name. That means your believing, believing is taken up a notch by trusting in His the Greek word here is a present participle meaning to the ones believing on His name. John doesn't use the noun form of the word for believe. That would be faith. He uses the verb form to stress that the believer's faith is an active faith. Ours is an active faith. Man, I'm believing on Him every single day. Hey, we do what we believe. Everything else is just talk. Listen to what I just said. We do what we believe. Everything else is just talk. The Bible says even the demons believe. But they don't trust. They don't act. So hear me very carefully as I close. Believing, listen, begins with a head knowledge which grows into a heart knowledge that you deeply believe that in Jesus you will find God's grace and the forgiveness of your sin. This then leads to a truth about the sinfulness of man in your dead spiritual condition and that only Jesus can resurrect your dead soul. For Christ, remember, we're dead in trespasses in sin. Now, you're not relying on your own strength. You're trusting in Him, His sacrifice. You're trusting in the power of His name. The result is the Holy Spirit of God comes to live with inside you. Takes up residence in your life. You know what the Bible says? The Holy Spirit becomes your comfort. Becomes your encourager. Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit. God in the person of the Holy Spirit becomes your friend. He becomes your conscience. Amen? He becomes your guide. You know, Jesus is a dividing line in your life. Do you know that? He's a dividing line in your life. When you receive Jesus and believe in His name, the natural and the spiritual result is that you become like Him in thought, in word, and in deed. When you believe in Him and you receive Him as Savior, there is a supernatural change it should come over your life if you genuinely been saved. Things are different. Listen, Jesus came. He came into this world to make things different. Jesus came to make all things new. Jesus came to reconcile me unto Him. And when Jesus comes into you, Things will be different. Heads are bowed, eyes are